Hello, I'm Kevin Cash, baseball in Tampa Bay. Have you ever wondered how it all started? It's a fascinating story about people, communities, and cultures that have contributed to more than 100 years of baseball history. The Rays are proud to celebrate baseball in Tampa Bay with a series of programs highlighting the rich tradition that began decades ago. So let's turn back the clock and enjoy the story of how it all began. Baseball from the beginning, Tampa Bay. It's an incredibly simple phrase, baseball in Tampa Bay. For many, it immediately brings to mind the Rays, and understandably so. Since that first game in front of a packed house on March 31st, 1998, the team that resides under the big top on the corner of First Avenue South and 16th Street has become a perennial playoff contender and a model of small market innovation in Major League Baseball. But once you start to dig a little deeper, you quickly realize the passion Tampa Bay has for baseball not only predates the Rays, it goes back to a time when the region is just starting to be discovered by the rest of the country, and Tampa and St. Petersburg are beginning to form very different identities. Well, St. Petersburg, Florida, in uh, the turn of the 20th century, was a sleepy town, but a town with great promise. Uh, it was only a little over a decade old. So it would have been a wonderful place to come, a very conservative community, a community obsessed with wholesomeness and morality. Uh, the big issue at that time would have been uh, whether to go dry or wet, the, the prohibition movement. And St. Petersburg clearly was inching toward uh, being a dry community. When the cigar industry came to the Tampa area and to Ybor in specific in, the, in 1885, 1886, um, there were about 700 to 1,000 people living in Tampa. So it was really, really small. Um, it didn't have much for industry. It was mostly just a port fishing type village. So when the cigars came and brought with them an influx of immigrants, uh, that's really when the population of Tampa exploded and again cigars were really the driving force behind that. Within the first decade, um, you know, there's about 10 to 13,000 people had already moved here. Tampa had gambling in the form of Bolita. Uh, they were betting on Cuban baseball and uh, everything. So it was, Tampa was a much more lively, more raucous town. Despite a region still in its infancy, a shared passion for baseball is already starting to take root. There are photographs of baseball teams in Largo and in Dunedin, um, which date to the late 19th century. Uniforms were kind of um, you know, piecemeal and oftentimes didn't match one another. There's picture evidence that, that dates to the late 19th century. Many accounts suggest that returning prisoners of war brought it from, uh, from the north. Regardless, uh, you have organized baseball being played by the 1870s and certainly by the 1880s. And clearly the, the formation of Ybor City uh, provides a spark. It started with the people that, that, that moved here. They came from Cuba where baseball is, of course, you know, you know it's like the, the, the sport. And then these people played through the various clubs, the Cuban club, the Italian club, uh, you know, different organizations, and they formed a league, and that became very popular. Many of their fathers, of the, the immigrant fathers, very much disapproved of baseball in the beginning, that you should be working for the family. Many of them were quite radical, believing baseball was an idle pursuit when you should be thinking about issues of social justice and workers' democracy. But, Ybor City became a madhouse for baseball. I've never heard people say specifically that baseball was the uniting force in Ybor City, but it had to be a uniting force. Um, you know, you have people coming from areas where they don't speak the same language, they're getting thrown together speaking Italian or, or Spanish. 
Um, it was hard for them to learn the languages back and forth. Um, so you, baseball was something that was a universal language, um, if you will. Uh, so it was a way for people to, to come together. Baseball transcends, it reinforces, it grounds issues of race, uh, ethnicity, and, and region. Uh, baseball is, is the one uniter in the area. Everyone is playing baseball. Church leagues are playing, Latin immigrants are playing, poor whites, poor blacks, turpentine leagues. Baseball is, is the game. There's nothing else even close. As the second decade of the 20th century dawns on Tampa Bay, the region is, by any measure, booming. And the popularity of baseball is growing almost as quickly as the local population. This is a time, 1910, you have movie theaters, you have dance halls. In Ybor City, you have, you have a, a, a vibrant Spanish language, Italian language theater going on, but baseball is, is the game that will bring everyone together. Again, it, it crosses, it transcends class, racial, ethnic lines. It's, it's extraordinarily popular. It's that combination of a shared passion for baseball and two communities that are not only growing in size, but in self-confidence that sets the stage on both sides of the bay for the game's next big step forward, the arrival of spring training. Two prominent civic leaders, Tampa Bay Mayor D.B. McKay and St. Petersburg's Al Lang are the driving forces as each city races to bring a team to West Central Florida. D.B. McKay, Donald Brennan McKay, it, it was a giant. Uh, Five-time mayor of Tampa, the owner of the Tampa Daily Times, the afternoon paper, um, a, a colorful, bigger-than-life personality, born in Reconstruction Tampa, lived until 1960. Al Lang was a lover of baseball. He had come from Pittsburgh. He loved his Pittsburgh Pirates. When he came to St. Petersburg, he saw the beauty of the place and he saw how perfect it would be for teams who wanted to come for spring training. Now, one of the first people who wanted spring training was Branch Rickey. And the reason he wanted spring training was that he was a teacher, he was an educator. He wanted to bring his players down and he wanted to teach them how to play the game, the fundamentals. And while Lang is probably best remembered for his connection to spring training, it's actually McKay and Tampa who are able to beat St. Pete to the punch and land one of baseball's most prominent teams in 1913. McKay lures uh, the Chicago Cubs in the, in the coming year. Uh, I think they, they, they promise room, board, and expenses for 35 players. After his initial efforts to lure his hometown Pittsburgh Pirates go nowhere, Lang turns his attention to an also-ran American League team from St. Louis. The Browns, the, the famous nickname was first in shoes, first in booze, last in the American League. They were a woeful team, one of the worst teams in baseball history. But they had a colorful player, manager, vice president by the name of Branch Rickey in 1914. So Rickey brings his team to St. Petersburg. The very first game that was played in St. Petersburg, down near, down near Coffee Pot Bayou, drew 15,000 fans. 15,000 fans in 1914. Uh, they came from everywhere. They came by train, they came by boat. They, they flocked to this ball game. Um, there were a ton of reporters from the north who came to the game. I mean, uh, this was something that was special and important and talked about. And it was the beginning. It was the beginning of something really terrific for the city of St. Petersburg. Not only did it kick off spring training coming to St. Petersburg, and you know, he, he's known as kind of like the father of baseball in Florida, so he brought it here to stay. A lot of people didn't think he'd be able to pull it off. Um, and he did, and it, it just opened the floodgates for Major League Baseball to come to Florida. It was certainly significant for the same reason it's significant that the Tampa Bay Rays play in St. Petersburg. It gives you a Major League uh, sort of panache. There's no question the, the luring the St. Louis Browns is a seminal moment 
in, in St. Petersburg history. It, it kind of validated a city on the rise. Uh, it confirmed that they could pull this off. And, and within 10 years, St. Petersburg is the epicenter of spring training. Nineteen fourteen, without a question, is a pivotal year in the city of St. Petersburg. We've got January first, nineteen fourteen, promptly at ten a.m. The Janus brothers make aviation history, having the world's first commercial airline service here. About six, eight weeks later, um, Al Lang brings spring training to St. Petersburg. So for a hundred years, those two uh, pivotal moments have really stood out. The St. Louis Browns' relationship with St. Pete turns out to be more of a fling, lasting only one year. But spring training will become as synonymous with the city as sunshine and palm trees. By the 30s, two of baseball's most successful franchises, the New York Yankees and the St. Louis Cardinals, were both spending their winters in St. Pete. Taking Lang's vision of using the game's massive popularity as a way to expose his city to winter-weary northerners to even greater heights. Ambassador of baseball, the godfather of spring training, whatever moniker you want to give him, without a question, I think Al Lang recognized the importance of, of baseball as a whole, as a sport, as a, as a communi community gathering device, but recognized that bringing in northern teams into St. Petersburg to practice, to train, would open up the exposure of the Sunshine City and encourage more folks actually to come here, again, selling St. Petersburg. When baseball came to St. Petersburg, it, it definitely put us on the map as far as people started realizing, oh, Florida, there's more than alligators and mosquitoes. And, and, it, and I think that it was, it was probably, you know, along with the trains that brought the people here, baseball was probably one of the biggest boosts to tourism in Florida's history. St. Petersburg, with its tourist economy, was, was better suited for spring training than Tampa, although Tampa, I, uh, what accommodations, the Tampa Bay Hotel, Plant Field was considered quite spectacular, but the players really wanted to be on the water, so uh, St. Petersburg uh, felt vindicated to get the Yankees and then the Cardinals. The thought of a big league team residing in Florida year-round is still decades away, but the popularity of the game and the success of spring training do create an atmosphere that allows for the creation of the region's first professional league. After World War I, there seems to be enough momentum and really the big issue here is there's transportation means to facilitate games between cities that are pretty far apart. Um, so in 1919, uh, there's a movement and uh, six teams in Florida form uh, the first Florida State League. It starts out as a D league, which is equivalent to today's high A minor leagues, and teams are spread out across Central Florida. By 1922, there are teams on both sides of the bay, and not surprisingly, the Tampa Smokers draw good crowds almost immediately. 700 to 1,000 people are gonna to come to most of the Tampa Smokers games in the inaugural year. Tampa's got a population of about, at the time, somewhere around 50,000, uh, uh, circa 1920. So, I mean, that's a pretty significant proportion of their population given uh, several things. Number one, all games are day games. There's no lights anywhere, so the games start at 3.30 and, you know, they end when they end. In the early years, the Smokers are led by player manager Tommy Leach, a veteran major leaguer who turns out to be very adept at handling a talented and diverse roster. He comes in and he's able to control that team the, the, in terms of the ethnic makeup of the team. He makes that diversity a strength and they have an unbelievable pitching staff and they have power, they hit for power. They finish the 1920 season, they win both halves, going away, they finish with a 756 win percentage, which is the highest in Florida State League history. Not to be outdone, the St. Saint Pete Saints field their first championship team in 1922. Among the players on that squad is Tarpon Springs' Elliot Bigelow, who goes on to become the first player from Pinellas County to reach the major leagues in 1929. The first year that the Florida State League goes C League, which would be roughly double A today, first year it goes C League, they win um, both halves of the uh, Florida State League, and they become the outright champions. 
Even though the league struggles financially and ultimately folds in 1928, the first Florida State League does serve a valuable purpose. It becomes a showcase for talented local players and sets the stage for one of Tampa's own to get discovered. The son of a cigar factory selector, Alfonso Ramon Lopez is born in Ybor City in 1908. By the time he gets to high school, Lopez is already a talented catcher and he attracts the attention of Tampa's Florida State League team. I think the first contract he signed professionally for the Tampa Smokers, um, nobody in the family had ever made that much money. So it was, and it wasn't a lot of money, but they didn't think him playing professional baseball was gonna be a career. The popularity of baseball in general, the fame of spring training, the attraction of spring training, clearly reinforced uh, local players wanting to be in the big leagues. The best example being Al Lopez. A product of Ybor City's baseball mad culture, Lopez gets to the big leagues in 1928 with the Brooklyn Robins. In a playing career that spans three decades, Al Senior would be a two-time All-Star and set the major league record for games caught, a mark that would stand until the late 80s. As good as he was between the lines, Lopez goes on to become, arguably, an even better manager, winning pennants in both Cleveland and Chicago. I think he did some things that were very innovative in baseball. Uh, I, I, I was told that he was the first one that backed up first base on a ground ball, and he did other things. Uh, he told stories about picking off a guy at, at certain bases. He would do certain things that nobody else had ever done before. So he kind of created things in baseball. He was a thinker. He had always proven that he was a natural leader, that ball players were attracted to him, that they listened to him, that he learned. He never stopped learning. He was always studying. He was always looking at the ways that other managers played their game, picking up this, picking up that. Uh, and he was very competitive, I mean, to a fault. He wanted to win. Winning at, in Cleveland and Chicago in an era where the Yankees were a dynasty uh, was, was something. Uh, always famous for his pitching staff, that 54 Cleveland team with Feller and Garcia and the go-go White Sox. I mean, that was one of the great stories in, uh, in that golden era of baseball. In 1977, Al Senior is given the game's highest honor, a spot in the Hall of Fame, cementing his legacy as a Tampa baseball legend. He started it all, the pioneer of baseball in Tampa, and Everybody felt like they could play ball. He made it without any fanfare, and there were no major league scouts then. He represented the community at, at the highest level, and when he was managing, everybody would pull for him. And I would, uh, when me and my dad would find the station, listen to Al, and hope Cleveland would win or the White Sox would win. I think it was a big deal, not just to the Spanish, but the immigrant community. I mean, the Italians, the, there were Germans that lived next door to us. Uh, you know, there was, it, was a, it was a mixed breed. There was a lot of different kinds of people here. Uh, but I think a lot of people that worked and lived in Ybor City, uh, at, to see somebody come out of the, the poverty of that area, uh, I think they were, they were very surprised and proud of that. When he made it into the majors, um, it was a time when Hispanic players didn't have a real big place in professional baseball. There are stories of his being ridiculed and people yelling names at him when he would appear on the field. So it was a, definitely a different time. And his being the first player from Ybor City, I think ignited a lot of people in the neighborhood who were also Hispanic, who also enjoyed ball, um, to think, well, he made it. I play right alongside him. Maybe this is something that's attainable for me as well. An idea that would only become more prevalent throughout the Bay Area over the years. With each passing decade, the roster of big league players and managers from the region grows more impressive. And while the list is undeniable, putting a finger on the exact reason for all of this homegrown talent is much harder to quantify. The stands at Cascadian Park would be filled on, you know, during the week and on weekends when they played. It was just a, a, a big event. Italian club versus the Cuban club versus Centro Studiano versus this. And, uh, as they grew old, started having kids, of course, they're going to be well versed in the fundamentals of the game. They are passionate about baseball and high school kids. They give them all they got. 
the weather in Florida helps. So it's just a lot of things going on that it's a, kind of a pipeline to the major leagues. The easy explanation of, of why Tampa was such a fertile area for producing ball players is well, you play year round, but you can do that in most places in the South. Clearly, there was a culture here that the Tony Cuccinello's, the Lopez's, the factory leagues in Ybor City, uh, Belmont Heights. Uh, this was, I mean, these were proving grounds in a lot of ways. Uh, baseball, it, it tells you how meaningful baseball was. Could be the bloodlines, I don't know. You could always say it's Boliche Boulevard, which is you get your, or your steaks, yellow rice and chicken, platanitos, everything else. Maybe that has something to do with it, but it's just, the kids embraced the game, they loved the game, they had a passion for the game. These are just a few of the stories and people that have been woven together over more than a century to create a rich history that is uniquely our story. Baseball and Tampa Bay. Four simple words that, depending on whom you ask, evoke answers you might not expect. The first thing I think of is the Rays, you know, that we finally got a Major League Baseball team. But I also think of all the spring training teams that trained here. The White Sox, the, the Reds, uh, the Yankees, the Cardinals, uh, the Phillies, you know, the, the Toronto. I mean, it, baseball has been a tremendous asset to this area and, and we should be very thankful for it. I look at all the kids that have come from all the different leagues that have played here and what they've added to the mystique of the Tampa baseball factory. I think of the guys that don't get a lot of headlines. I think of Bobby Lamont. I think of um, Joseph Aloysius Goldie Rapp. I think of um, Elliot Bigelow. Uh, I think of Hank Johnson. Baseball in Tampa, deep roots. Uh, baseball in Tampa, wound as tight as the horse hide of a baseball. What comes to my mind, baseball in Tampa Bay? It, it just goes together. I mean, I, every time you, you, you read a story in this area, in this community, um, you, there's so many local ties to the, the game of baseball. 